something awesome. And today we are celebrating something awesome about Jennifer Zhang. Uh, Jennifer is a uh, actress, a producer, a screenwriter, a musician, martial artist, uh, all around badass. And uh, we've been, uh, you know, we, we've traveled in similar circles for a few years now. And uh, over the past couple of years, I've watched her star just skyrocket throughout the film festival circuit with repeated hit after hit after hit after hit. So uh, I have the pleasure, distinct pleasure of talking with her today about uh, a number of her short films and uh, a few other things that are gonna, that whatever comes up. So yeah, let's just uh, dive on in. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I'm just going to take what you said, transcribe it and then use that as my bio going forward. <laughs> that, was, that was very flattering. I thank you for that, right on the top, right at the oh, top. Oh, well, you know, you've earned it. And also, I mean, you absolutely are a badass because you got a bat left over your fireplace. I mean, that's that's major geek points right there. So you know what that's that is? Geek, geek points that you've earned, not, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's see. I remember, God, I don't, like, you and I both used, both used to hang out at Ground Control together. You know, off and on I over the years. I was trying to figure out like what was the er what was our origin story, and that yeah. that's be a lot of people's origin story. Yeah, yeah that was. Control. God, I miss Ground Control. It was so much fun for for the uninitiated. Ground Control was a goth industrial karaoke night at a gay bar uh, in in Mid Wilshire, and it was uh, uh, on every Monday night. The the uh, the rivet heads and the goths would descend and do everything from Susie and the Banshees to. Uh, to, to Broadway hits. And it was, uh, it was quite the experience, but I remember, I think the first time I actually noticed you, uh, it was because you were rocking a power glove. And I was like, yeah, I, I was like, okay, who is this girl with the power glove? Cause that is dope as hell. So yeah, I remember that. And I think we just like hooked up on Facebook after that at one point. And we've just been, you know, just like seeing each other, or I've at least been seeing you in my feed and just watching you just take off. Uh, especially over the last few years. It's just been really, really impressive to behold. Well, you so. know, overnight, what is it What is it that's saying that... Uh, 14 years to be an overnight success? Yeah, there you go. So mm -hmm. it feels yep. like it's taken off. I doesn't feel like it from this end, so... No, but you're finally, I feel like you're finally starting to get some well-deserved recognition for all of your work, and that's, that's mm -hmm. wonderful to see. And hopefully... Um, you know, if people stumble upon this, they'll get to know you a little bit better and be like, oh, my God, she's awesome. And then go and check out all of your stuff, too. So, you know, that 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 is the goal here. So um, let me see here. Yeah. Are you now? Uh, so we know each other from Ground Control. Now, are you from L.A. originally or are you from elsewhere? I I was born not in this state. I was born okay. in a state that I would rather not associate with my myself with anymore these days. But I uh, grew up grew up in California. Um, maybe closer to the OC and then went okay. to UCLA and kind of has been stuck here ever since by choice. Gotcha. Happy, I'm a happy captive. So. Absolutely. What'd you study at UCLA? <clears throat> Get you while you're taking a sip. Yeah. <laughs> East Asian studies and mass communications. So it's, okay. it's kind of funny. I'm I've, there was a point in my life where I thought I would be an East Asian scholar, you know, but the thing is that comes from being a, huge fucking nerd. I can I can curse on this, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. No, I fucking curse on him here all the time. Being a huge fan of the mummy, right? Uh, it's my, okay. My entire life has been like this where like I was a huge fan of the X-Files in high school. So I was certain I was going to be an FBI agent. Uh -huh. And of course I wanted to be an FBI agent just to see if I can access the files that they have on like Roswell, right? Uh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, that's like the whole point. Yep. Yep, yep. And then you know, I grew up and became a mature woman and then watched the mummy and decided i wanted to be just like Evie. <laughs> so i, I mean like, i'm gonna be a nerdy bookish girl that like reads a bunch of old historical texts and and makes that you know my entire personality so for a while i thought i was going to be an east asian studies scholar so that's so cool and you know and the mummy like isn't just like an inspiration. I feel like it's its own sexual orientation because you know you're always just like into somebody in that cast. You know that whole cast is just smoking hot. So, yeah, time. yep, yep. I mean, por qué no los dos, right? <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so what? Uh, so the mummy got you into wanting to make movies, and and also big shout out to X Files. My wife's a huge X Files fan. We she, she when she found out that I hadn't seen them all, we shotgun the whole series in about three months. And yeah, that also just brilliant, brilliant television, uh, br bleh, brilliant television. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It wasn't the mummy that made me want to get into film though. 
all of it. Yep. We'll get to, we'll get to that, I guess. <laughs> yes, that absolutely. That's right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Sometimes the ADHD is strong here. The squirrels kind of go running around, and sometimes I I screw details up. But yes, we're screwed. I I have ADHD too. What what the hell? Oh. This is gonna be garbage. <laughs> Yep. Throw it all yep. away. Throw the whole podcast. Yep. Okay. We're just going to restart it. I'm just going to log off. We're going to start it back up again and be like, hey, what's up? So, uh, but yeah. So, what? So, in that case, what did inspire you to become a filmmaker and a storyteller? <clears throat> well, you know, I, I wanted, uh, it, I would. <sighs> things have always been really bifurcated. Like there was always a thing that I wanted to be my day job. And there was a thing that I wanted to do for fun until it became my day job. And for a while mm -hmm. I wanted to be a fantasy writer. Um, oh. And so I, I, oh God, it's so convoluted. So I started, that was where my love of storytelling, you know, began. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think somewhere along the line that turned into me wanting to write books that I knew would be good movies. And okay. then, and then that turned into like learning how to be a screenwriter. And then it turned into, um, well, I want to be an actress. And I was like, oh, if I write things that get made into movies and people want to buy the scripts, but I won't let them buy it unless I get a part in the movie. That was my master plan. That's not how it works in Hollywood. No, <laughs> I, unfortunately I not. It works great in theory, you know? Yeah, they're like, yeah, that's great. Uh, this is what we're willing to offer for the script. And if you don't want it, then fuck you. Right. Yeah, so, pretty much. And we're going to put Scarlett Johansson in the role that you wanted for yourself. Yeah. Right. Right. Precisely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a, it was kind of a, you know, just a series of errors and judgment that kind of led me into this career. So I was in like, I was in publishing for a while and I was at Warner mm -hmm. Brothers, the publishing department. Um, they did a lot of books that were based on their IP and I was part of the department that kind of oversaw that global initiative. Um, and at the time there was a massive layoff Mm -hmm. this, this, uh, truly, I, I'm going to deliver on the convoluted. All good. No worries. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm here for the convolution. There was a massive layoff and there was one woman there that I had really connected with and she was laid off from the department. Mm -hmm. And she like Jerry Maguire me basically because she was like, well, nice. fuck you. I'm going to go start my own company. And I was like, and I'm going with you. I was the Renee Zellweger, right? Um, yeah. She was friends with one of the co-executive producers of a little show called Friends. <laughs> okay. And it was around the time that Friends was ending. So mm -hmm. he was, one, attached to executive produce the spinoff, the short-lived mm. spinoff, Joey, mm -hmm. but was also looking to like start his own production company. Mm -hmm. So him, this woman that I was working with at Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. um, started a venture and brought me on as their first employee. And suddenly, mm. whereas I was mostly, you know, just had this like this dumb fantasy of like, you know, the power of the written word. And that was going to get me into movies. Suddenly I was working for people who needed me to start producing. Mm -hmm. And that's where I cut my teeth as a producer because um, there was really no one else. It was such a small company. Yeah, so yeah. I learned on the job, hated it then, hate it to this day. Mm hmm. It's been, you know, my bread and butter. It's been my day job for my entire adult life. Um, but it was always supposed to be a means to an end, which was to get things that I wrote onto the screen. Um, yes. It's only really in the last. Oh, gosh. You know, we'll, we'll get to it. But my first feature film was like 15 years ago now. Oh, and then, shit. Okay. Yeah. 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 And there was a huge chunk of time in the middle. Um where I couldn't get another feature film off the ground. Okay, and this is the script that you sold, or is this a movie that you produced, or both? It's a movie that I produced, and okay. like, really killed me. But that was basically how I started in, in show business, was starting as a bookish writer, and then mm -hmm. being thrust into producing, and then trying to use those skills to make movies eventually. Uh, it's, it's, it's too much. It's really, yeah. It really actually makes me feel like I need, you know, like a drink but i've got much <laughs> so it's okay. just, just one huh yeah all right well i mean everything in moderation right so mm -hmm. yeah uh so let me ask you, uh what would you say is like your i mean i think you kind of already covered this but your goal you would say that your goal is to get your your stuff up and out there uh, yes i want to i want to tell good stories mm -hmm. um 
whatever form that takes, but it seems like the form that I'm, I've chosen or mm-hmm. that has chosen me is feature films. Nice. Short films are just a means of, you know, trying to get all the pieces in place for a feature, for another feature. It would be my third. The next one coming up would be my third. So um, one hopes that somewhere on this crazy journey, it gets easier, but I've been yeah. told it doesn't. So why did I do this to myself? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I feel like those of us in the industry here have to have um, a real masochistic streak. There's, and after a while, that's that's kind of like the strange catch-22 of it is you start out with so much passion. And the harder you pursue it and the the more, you know, strange bedfellows you have and like... Mm-hmm. Um, bad people that you encounter, you get extremely jaded and cynical and like deadened until you do start getting some successes. But by that time, you're so numb. Yeah. You're so numb to the grind and the hustle that it's almost like you can't quite enjoy it the way you know a younger version of yourself would have. The younger version yeah. of yourself that's set out on the journey, right? So it's cruel, mm-hmm. but at this point, it's just compulsion. God. Yeah. It's, it's, we do it because it's what we know. And Mm -hmm. I mean, I, God, I can empathize with that. I've been producing theater in this town since 2008. And, you know, I think back to some of our biggest hits and our biggest, most successful productions. And I can think of all like the good times that we had, but every show, no matter how good or amazing it was or how well received it was, I was there for how you know all the all the backstage bullshit and everything else all the drama behind it and it's tough because that's what i wind up thinking about when i think back on these shows is all of like the the shit that i got dragged through just to get that damn show up you know and it's it's hard it's bitter like you know it's fun talking to people and they have all these memories of like oh my god that was amazing and i had such a great time with it and i'm just so proud of the work and i'm like yeah (laughs) Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Finger guns, you know? Yeah. Just mm. it's it's hard. Like uh one of my projects right now is trying to get the archive of uh of our 15 year history up online again. And mm. uh it's it's tough going through some of these photos and trailers and, and press clippings and stuff, just remembering this stuff. It's uh like going back and revisiting this deep seated emotional shit that I didn't realize was there. It's like this is why I pay my therapist, you know. So <laughs> private vietnam yeah yourself through yeah yep pretty much pretty much and uh you know and then we still do it you know i'm i'm, I'm producing shows this year too so it's like but if we do it because I, I i do think that though the deep down we do it because we love it and because we have something that we want to say you know yeah. and, and you feel like you know when you after you create it it'll exist yes <laughs> yep. so you would have done something that you know, hopefully leaves a legacy and, and that's, you know, and, and hopefully made enriched to other people's journey a little bit. We only have so much time on this earth. Yeah. So exactly. you know you've made something good, then you know, you've um, given people something good to enjoy. Right. Oh my God. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the only meaning there is to life is what we give it. So, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so before we get d- diving into the the film stuff, I was uh, I was cruising your your YouTube and I saw one of your shorts and I was very very impressed because I mean I've got a I've got a black belt in Taekwondo myself and I used to to do you know WTF Olympic style competitive sparring and I was just like holy shit how many different martial arts styles do you know I mean I think I feel like you know all of them just from what I saw. Well, I'm I'm going to be brutally brutally honest and I I think it's really important. Uh, to be honest about this kind of thing, mm-hmm. because there's a lot of people falsely representing like how good they are at martial arts. Mm-hmm. See, that's like the trend. Um, the only reason why I have like as many styles as I have mm-hmm. is because I haven't spent much time on any of them. Oh, I mean, gotcha. That's, that's okay. the absolute truth of the matter. Um, and it's not the way I don't endorse it. It's not the way to do martial arts. Um, sure. Because, uh, you know, you should they, people should be doing them the way you did it. You get the black belt, right? But um, I did kickboxing for about two years. Mm-hmm. And then I did something called Bok Fu Pai, which is like a Southern Chinese style, like Shaolin style okay. martial arts, Kung Fu. Um, for uh, 
I want to say four years. That was the longest I spent uh, studying one particular martial art. Okay. And then I did something called, and this is funny. So, <laughs> all right. So, so the Bok Fu Pai, that, mm -hmm. the Bok Fu Pai Kung Fu was probably the most serious um, martial art that I took and like took mm -hmm. it seriously. After that, I took something called uh, Neo Ninjutsu. So Neo Ninjutsu. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like the kind of shit that would be taught by a guy who lives in a van down by the river, you know, like, it's yeah. mainly practiced by like ex military mm -hmm. or, you know, so the, the idea of it is because ninjutsu is not a martial art that ever had a real modern school, right? Because it started yeah. out as the art of assassination. Yeah. And, and there's a reason why it's, you know, banned in the MMA, because the entire purpose of ninjutsu is you end the fight quickly either yeah. you get it, it's like how how to get out of a fight quickly or how to do so much damage that your opponent can't you know continue the fight yeah um two things that completely lack honor <laughs> that you don't want to bring into any formal arena right mm -hmm. um kind of like krav maga a little bit yeah so it's, you can see how, just... yeah you can see how it appeals to a certain type of man right mm -hmm. Um, and Neo Ninjutsu oh, is very, yeah. in my opinion, very irresponsible, right? And it's called Neo Ninjutsu because it applies like the philosophies of Ninjutsu and some traditional Japanese martial arts and um, modernizes it, right? The instructor that I had uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> taught us like how to use like a gun as like after you've exhausted your ammo, how to use the gun as like a, a weapon that you could use in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right. Sure. Sure. How to um, pistol whip. Yeah. And uh, I studied that for, you know, good number three or four years, I want to say. Oh, wow. uh, and that was very, you know, it was very useful. But when you look at it, like real martial artists would not consider it very uh, legitimate, I guess. Right. Because the, the drills we would run is like we'd have to like just get dropped into the middle of like a parking lot and then try to like, okay, and then now this person's gonna be your attacker and you need to use things in the parking lot. Like, how do you how do you navigate around these cars? How do you use these cars as like a way to like get out of the fight? Or is there like a pile of garbage somewhere that you can like find something that you could use as a weapon? And then how do you adapt that thing into a weapon? And that's why we were trained in like Eskrima, which, you know, yeah, yeah. Anything that you would find in a junk pile that resembles like a long stick, then suddenly it's an Eskrima stick. So I know like hardcore martial artists are listening to everything I'm saying and being like, that is some bullshit. And let me tell you, I knew it the entire time and it was mm -hmm. so much fun. So <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, also, like, I wouldn't fuck with you in a dark alley, you know, like. I was getting, you know, bits and pieces, like, because it does incorporate traditional martial arts. Yeah. So I was picking up, you know, Eskrima, I was picking up nunchucks, which mm -hmm. is like a traditional Japanese weapon, but mm -hmm. ninjutsu is kind of a free for all. <laughs> and <laughs> I was picking up katana, um, I was picking up gun. <laughs> so it was, it was a fun time. Uh, but again, it wasn't, it was probably more functional, more practical than it was like an art. And mm -hmm. then after that, I took Taekwondo for a little bit for about mm -hmm. a year and a half. So as you can see, it's really scattered. It's all over the place. And the truth is I look okay doing it on screen because there's great stunt coordinators, you know, yeah. there's great fight choreographers. There's people that can take just the basic knowledge of fight physicality and then turn it into something that looks beautiful and polished um and i say all that because i get the reaction that you're that you're giving me um often from you know people they're like wow i wouldn't mess with you i would and and my answer to that is yes please don't because if you try to hit me you will succeed <laughs> <laughs> don't hit me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're so you know we're we're luring people into a false sense of security here, so she can actually kill you when you're not looking. You know. So that's that's the trick. You know. Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe I am black widowing. Like, I guess we'll never know. You yeah. Know? Don't hit me. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Amazing.
fucking love that. But I did see your uh, your one of your fight reels and shit. That was impressive. Yeah, you you Thank definitely you. you 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 definitely are talented uh, as as an artist and also clearly work with talented people who know what the fuck they're doing. Which you know, I mean, filmmaking is like theater. Filmmaking is a team sport. You know, and you're only as good as your your weakest link on the team. And and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I watched a little bit of Street Fighter High, and you know, you're bad. <laughs> like you, you you got it all out there on Maine, so I was like, I just got to check it a little bit, you know. So like that that that's yeah. like you've got some you've got some really fun projects, your Batman stuff too, and like the the whole yeah. So those, those were the golden days. That those were the days where I didn't have to strategize a career, and I could just do stuff that I liked and do them with my friends and you know and not care about uh making things perfect yeah but, you know, to be to be honest i really think that there's there's a lot of value in that youtube mentality we have oh, like yeah. a whole we have a whole generation of people i mean the the circle that we ran in and you know um and people younger than us uh grew up making content as opposed mm -hmm. to traditional media and yeah. i i would posit that one of the things that keeps most people from making movies or like going for you know putting together treatments for like tv shows and stuff is that they need it to be perfect before they do anything oh, and the, perfect is such the enemy of good yeah it really is and the, the lesson that people who create content uh learn right off the bat is it doesn't have to be perfect it just has to be watchable right it just yeah. has to not be terrible and even if it is terrible, it doesn't matter, then you'll make the next thing will be less terrible. And those are kind of, I think, the cornerstones of like having a prolific career, right? 100%. Um, which, yeah, I mean, that's it, it's there, there's a lot of there's a, there are a lot of like things that apply pressure, a lot of fake rules that somehow everybody decides are like real rules in the industry. Yeah. Um, you know, for the longest time, people were like, there are three things you don't make, a musical, a period piece, and I can't remember the third one. But it doesn't matter because it's probably, <laughs> right. But it's probably yeah. something that it currently is like dominating the box office, right? Like yeah. Barbie has a full on musical number in it, right? La La yeah. Land broke so many records. Chicago was massive. And I mean, girls, the, the new mean girls remake is a musical and they're not advertising it as one, but it is. Yeah. yeah. For the longest time. And I know this cause I was pitching musicals um, and period pieces mm -hmm. when this was all I was hearing. Well, it's, you know, these don't make money. These don't bring in box office, blah, blah, blah. Now look at us. So one of the, um, yeah. Oh, the ADHD kicked in. Cause I can't remember. All good. Yeah. No, I got on this subject, something about, the fake rules in Hollywood. Yes. How don't make musicals, don't make period pieces, don't make one of the other ones. And I'm sure back to me. There was some some yeah. some other fake rule that I abided by that like people abided by that abi that people abide by that is extremely damaging. But yeah. Maybe my point was, you know, don't worry about making things perfect. Oh, the fake rule. I remember yes. now. So there's there's like something I heard over and over again throughout my entire career is like if you you know when you're starting out if you make a feature film if you don't make another feature film within two years um it's like your career has started over you might not you might you might as well not even have made the first one because you've shown that you're not like somebody who can you know like someone with keep, stamp keep up it yeah keep up a production yeah so um made my when i made my first feature i ground so hard to try to like get a second feature funded right mm -hmm. um and i tried so hard to do one at the one million dollar mark because the first mm -hmm. one the first feature i did was not anywhere near a million dollars and i was like i have to level up and because i held myself to that like my next one has to be between one and three or two and five million dollars or else i'm a failure you know i really sabotaged myself mm -hmm. right i really should have made another movie for something far less, something in the lower six figures, um, like I did my first. But yeah. because I held myself to this fake rule that people kept telling me was the rule. Um, the two years elapsed, or the two years lapsed, and I was like, well, my feature filmmaking career has now restarted. And it was such a demoralizing um, <sighs> thing yeah. that I internalized that I kind of just started producing you know, for companies, because I was like, well, I couldn't cut it. Um, 
everything mm -hmm. is nothing is for nothing though right because it was through yeah. producing for companies producing commercials trailers industrial videos commercials for years and years that i've met like the majority of the crew that currently i use in all of my narrative work so it all mm -hmm. turned out fine in the end it's it's always going to be fine in the end and if it's not fine it's not the end but um I love that, that. Was like the, I heard it in a show that I didn't like, but that was the takeaway. I was like, that's a, that's a mighty fine quote. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I, you know, I really stymied myself for a really long time listening to people about like, this is how it is. This is how the industry is. And this is how things have to be. And this is how you have to, this is how you advance. And now I'm like, yeah. thank God for my skincare routine. I'll tell you that like, <laughs> I a few more years that I wasted. So. Anyway. Well, you look fantastic. So, Thank you. yeah. Um, so, but yeah, but I think that actually brings us, that's a wonderful segue to talk, uh, to talk about your, your current career arc. And I mean, I would dare say Renaissance that you're experiencing right now, or at least that's what it appears to be because you seem to be fucking crushing it. Um, you know, I, I, uh, you, like, I, I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, I've been doing theater for so long that uh, and I came out here to do TV and movies myself, but you know, as, as an actor, not necessarily as a, as a writer or producer, but like watching everything you've been doing, I'm like, God damn it. I have to start doing shorts and stuff now too, because like, I want, I want to get that momentum going. I want to get that kind of groove going that I see that you've got. And I, I would, I would hope to have a fraction of the success I've seen you have, but this, uh, it all seemed to start with, uh, it Charon, Caron, how, how do you pronounce it? Oh, so. So Should have I've asked been, about this one too before we started. <laughs> okay, it's I actually want I want the title to be you know confusing because it, it it's oh, not until you watch the movie that um, it makes sense. So it's pronounced Sharon. But Sharon, the, okay. It's not the way it's. I mean, obviously it's it's Caron. It's like yeah, it's the, the yeah the the river man to the dead the land of the dead yeah across the river six. So, um, but it's a plot point in the story that the character. The character's parents didn't know how to spell Sharon. So she gets this very dark and morbid name as a result of that. And you know, it kind of colors like the the path that her life takes. And like, I love that. I love so, that. That's such a great fucking character hook. That's hilarious and fantastic. Um, so with Sharon, what what is uh that you you shot that during COVID, during lockdown? Yeah. So everything good comes from everything bad in, in my life. It seems to be the pattern. So I had a, um, I had a feature film right before, uh, lockdown mm -hmm. that was getting a lot of interest and had two potential financiers that would have, would have been like the most ever, like together would have been the most ever raised for a feature. Right. Oh, wow. The pandemic starts and one of them pulls out, because most of his money's in real estate. And, mm, he's, uh -oh. yeah. and everyone was saying at the beginning of the pandemic that the thing that was going to get hit hardest, one mm -hmm. of the many things that was going to get hit hard was real estate, right? Because mm -hmm. no, no one's going to buy a house in the middle of the pandemic and people are going to be leaving the cities, blah, Cut blah, blah. Cut to six months later and the housing market's insane, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that financier got very cold feet, um, tabled his, like, soft commitment. The other one who was in, if the first one was in, right. Oh uh, shit. Okay. A lot of, a lot of film financing happens where like, if you can get somebody, if you can get first money in, somebody else will like match it because someone else is already like vouched for it essentially. So mm -hmm. even though the two didn't know each other, the fact that the first person was out, that second person was also out. Right. Um, really devastating, especially since at that point it had taken me like 10 years to get to the point where I was like, ready to make another feature um and there was really i was kind of just on a like i know what people want the narrative to be right I, I know people want the narrative to be like no i will not be defeated by this i'm gonna make a movie in my apartment god damn it you know and like the the bad bitch thing but it was really like well well i still want to make a movie I guess I'll just do it in my apartment, you know? So it wasn't, it wasn't as much of a, you know, a, a Disney heroine like moment as much as it was, well, I'll make a movie anyway. Um, I got nothing better to do. <laughs> That's awesome. So, 
So it was me and a cell phone. And I, I sat down and like wrote a script in three days, like a feature length script. That is my, my superpower is being able to write feature length content in like less than a week. Oh my um, God. I wish I, I'd, my, I'd kill for that. It comes from my mentor, uh, yeah. Blake Snyder, the late great Blake Snyder who wrote Save the Cat. Mm -hmm. um, when I was studying under him, he'd said to be a working like screenwriter in this town, you really have to be able to write something in two weeks. Uh, and I get it. I've, I've actually, I've actually seen that in action. It's not the hard and fast rule, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, but there are a lot of opportunities that come along where like you pitch an idea to somebody mm -hmm. or somebody and they love the idea. And then the thing is, if too much time passes, they'll love five other ideas on that they'll hear from waiters and, you know, mm -hmm. aspiring actors just on their way to the studio office. So while it's fresh in their mind, you really got to get something on paper to like yeah. capitalize on an opportunity. Um, that's kind of the best thing about being in Hollywood proper is like you get a lot of opportunities as long as you know when not to let like if you're watching out for them and you know when to capitalize, you can do really well. I, I say this speculatively. I've not done very, very well, but I've seen people around me, you know, right place, right time. But at the same time, they also like applied a massive amount of skills. It was, they got their 10,000 hours in and then mm -hmm. it was time to shine and they made sure the opportunity didn't um, pass them by. So anyway, so Blake had said, you have to be able to write a screenplay in like, uh, you know, one to two weeks tops. And I trained myself to be able to do that. Um, utilized it in the stupidest time possible, which was pandemic when we had infinite time. <laughs> so I don't know why I was rushing, but I wrote a screenplay in three weeks or three days um, and then just set up my cell phone and then just started filming it. Like every day I'd wake up in the morning. So the, so I'd wake up in the morning. Wait, hold on. I should do it the other way around the night before. Mm -hmm. It was like, where do I start the cycle? Night before, I would shot list all the pages I wanted to shoot the next day. Right. Shot mm -hmm. list. Um, next morning, wake up early in the morning and just start filming, just checking off my shot list. Uh, and the thing is, I did it all on an iPhone 8. Mm -hmm. And then when I got everything in the can, I would be exhausted and I would get in bed and I would just edit it on my phone with an app. So I edited no the shit. entire feature film on an app on my phone. So, wow. and after I got those clips done and exported, then I'd pick up the script and then shot list the next day's um, scenes and then just do it, you know, ad nauseum um, until the whole movie was done. And the thing is at the time I thought I was just gonna throw it on YouTube, you yeah. know, and, and if 500 people watch it, it in its entire life, um, lifespan, I will be happy. And it wasn't until I sent it to my manager who admittedly, he, he told me, I love him, he's so blunt. He goes, I'm gonna be honest, when you first sent to me, I was like, what is this bullshit? <laughs> and he said- <laughs> and He's a good manager. It, yeah, and then he watched it and he was like, oh, Jennifer made an actual movie, right? So he was the one that told me I have to put it in festivals. And so I started submitting festivals. And the thing is everything that everyone was submitting at the time, um was quarantine material because that's mm -hmm. what anybody was able to make yeah you know? uh with whatever if they happen to be locked down with camera equipment right and a yeah. pod of people that was like their 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 pod mm -hmm. then they could make content and the thing that everybody mm -hmm. wanted to do was just to document or like you know spoof the experience of the pandemic and that's not what my story was about so no so i think i'm guessing and, I, and I've been told by a couple of festival organizers that that's why my feature stood out because it wasn't a pandemic story. Yeah, it, it was you, you took the restrictions of the pandemic and told a different story. And mm -hmm. uh, that's part of what made it stand out. Because, yeah, I saw I saw as, as a theater producer reading all the scripts that were coming out. Yeah, the number of fucking pandemic scripts that I saw. I'm just like, dude, we're all living this right We're now. We're, 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 we're here in this moment. Like, save your big, the pandemic changed my life for mm -hmm. like maybe in a decade. You know, like, let's, yeah, yeah, let's that get out of this. Let's get some perspective, you know. And the fact that you took those restrictions and then 
took the opportunity to tell a different story, I that absolutely would make that stand out. Yeah. Well, it was like, it was, it was fun because it was a story about a woman. It was about, a, it's about a hacker who was under house arrest for like a really terrible crime that she committed, mm -hmm. a hacking crime, <laughs> a hacking crime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, she's a hacker who did a hacking crime. Um, mm -hmm. And she's got a boyfriend that she can only interact with over Skype. So like mm -hmm. the, the entire plot lent itself to the way it was shot, right? So, um, so I had another actor that I hadn't seen in like, what you know, probably about a decade in person, but he was mm -hmm. willing to do the project. Um, and so he would just Skype in and he would do his part and I would film it practically. I would literally just film the screen, film him Skyping in, and then we would do the scene. Um, and he was the third actor because at the time I had casted uh one dude who was all on board and then he got really scared because he was mm. like we really don't know how sag is going to react to people doing um Shit like, this, yeah. like we don't know if like the argument but it was a pandemic and i didn't have other work so i had to do a non-union project like they mm -hmm. didn't know if that would fly and at the time sag was actually sending out letters to its members saying don't do projects in this time, right? Like we will yeah. find, which was them being responsible, yep. right? We stop, stop the spread. But, yeah. um, but I had one actor pull out for that reason. I had another actor pull out because he initially thought it's like such a great idea. And then he was like, oh, it's gonna look like crap because it's gonna be filmed on the iPhone 8. And I was like, yes, it is gonna look like crap. There's gonna be no, there's gonna be no getting around that. Yeah. Um, but but that's such a lovely conceit for it though. I, you know, it's, it's like, it's like filmmakers who like to still shoot on 16 millimeter or something like that. You know, there, there's sometimes you just have like this, this style and conceit. I, I that that's a bummer that they got snobby about it. You know, that's okay. I mean, yeah. it, it is, it is a bummer. Thank you for, for commiserating with me about it. But um, I think what you, you know, you find like, we don't, nobody gets into this industry without having a healthy ego yeah <laughs> it's, it's just what it it's what it attracts it's just the 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 fact of the matter so um you know present myself included mm -hmm. I mean, help very healthy ego you have to have a very healthy ego because everyone's going to tell you you're garbage you're not famous enough you're not rich enough you're not pretty enough you're not connected enough you're going to hear that 10 times a day so the yeah. only so you really need to buoy yourself with something and an ego is the is the quickest thing to to you know to attach yourself to so you stay afloat so i've extended that metaphor way too far but anyway. no but it works though so you know it's it, you, it it's pretty elastic i dig it so, so that um, one into, oh sorry oh no no it's okay um now that, that you, you submitted that one to festivals but i also remember seeing something about you gave yourself a concussion in the middle of shooting and you kept shooting yeah at one point? Uh, oh because that's the take right <laughs> i mean yeah yeah, that, you know, you know instantly. Um, I had a really great uh, actor friend. The one scene that has two people mm -hmm. actually in one space together, um, and he's a really he's a really good action action director, stunt coordinator, fight choreographer. Like he does all of it, anything mm -hmm. action related. And so I was in really good hands. The fuck up was mine. So mm -hmm. <laughs> basically, what happened was. He had a pair of gloves that, you know, had the, the carbon fiber knuckles. Mm -hmm. So it was supposed to be that he was grabbing the back of my head and like slamming me into a wall, mm -hmm. but his hand was going to take the full brunt of that. Right. Sure. Sure. Um, I have really glossy hair. It's, it's Asian. Mm -hmm. So what happened was when he tried to slam me into a wall, his hand slipped and mm -hmm. I should have felt it slip and not, you know, like lean into it as hard as I did, but it, I just wasn't fast enough to react. And I felt his hand slip and I went and did it anyway. And just completely mm. like I saw stars yep. and we didn't even have to do any sound design on that scene because oh, the oh, not okay. that you have my actual skull cracking. Oh, God. But then okay. Yeah. Finished mm -hmm. the tape and then I was like, you know, like still seeing flashes and I like, pick up. I'm like, no, that's the take moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Check the gate. <laughs> we got yep, it. That did it. All right. Awesome. How, and that, that, Oh God. Yeah. I've, I've definitely had, had those moments and that's always the damn take. That's the you take. Know, I mean, that you're not 
anything better than that. Yeah. Um, and it ended up winning festivals, getting into deadline, you know. Yeah. Like, everybody I knew my entire life called me the day it got into deadline. Like it it was it was interesting. It was such a good it it was such a a, a good picture. That's what I wanted to say. It's yeah. a, and I mean literal picture. Um my friend McCall Jones mm-hmm. took a photograph of me looking all directory before mm-hmm. the pandemic. And um, it was submitted with the press release that my manager submitted. And it was just, it was great. It was a great picture. And it was just splashed across the entire article. It really made me look like a big deal. Um, yeah, it's a great picture. I'm going to see if I can pull it up real quick here. I've got it. I saw it on, it came up in my Google earlier. I didn't want to grab it because of the copyright on no, it. But... I, I don't know that. Um, and as you do that, I, I don't know that people really read the article and saw that I had done a feature on a cell phone. I think just the headline and the fact that it was deadline and that as great as that picture was, there we go. Um, yeah, great right picture. across. Um, even though that's not a real film camera, that was that was this is a I shouldn't say this. That was McCall's camera, right? Because even oh, though yeah. I direct, you know, this is a stage camera. I wasn't directing anything. Um, because there was no picture of me directing Sharon because yeah. I was acting in Sharon and directing was with a cell phone. So I don't know that people had read the article. All they did was see the headline, see that it was in deadline, see this picture. And then mm-hmm. I was just getting congratulations like all day long. Like everybody I'd ever worked with. I must have gotten over 200 phone calls and text messages that day. It, That's it awesome. A span of 12 hours. Um, and then, you know, just leverage that into the next thing. And then leverage the next thing into the next thing. And here we are today. And here we are today. Yeah. And let's see. So Sharon went uh, to a whole ton of different festivals and, and cleaned up from what I saw. Yeah. Um, oh, and I see it in the trivia here. Uh, the titular character's name is pronounced like Sharon, not Karen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And right, right there in the, uh, right there in the trivia. Uh, yeah. Nine wins, seven noms here. Let me. Because we're just gonna. I should be so much faster with this, but I'm not. Okay, here, here we go, and there we go. It was kind so, of a strange. It was kind of a strange thing, though, because you know, even though it got in a bunch of festivals, I couldn't mm-hmm. go to any of the festivals. None of us could. Oh, yeah, because it was all yeah, because 2020, yeah, all still just right in the middle of uh, quarantine and everything. Yeah. It was going to be another like year and a half before anybody for any or even two years before any my god we were all it's like two years of our lives yeah really it's really kind of mind-blowing before um so even though this got into a bunch of festivals it wasn't um i didn't get the festival experience yeah. i didn't know what was i didn't know what was coming basically well i like, mean you you definitely made up for that and also uh, we'll, we'll get to it in a minute but you definitely took the opportunity the red carpet opportunities and maximized them to make one hell of a statement uh one one hell of a visual statement we'll shout that out in a in a minute here or two but yeah international independent film awards indie fest horrible imaginings frostbite international mobile film festival all Alt- uh alternative film fest jelly film fest i mean all over the place and you know Nominee, nominee, semifinalist, winner, best feature, best film, nominee. You know, like, yeah, cru- best actress, crushing it. I mean, just in- incredible, you know? I mean, bravo. You just, that's so awesome that that's, uh, that's part of the legacy for that. And you definitely didn't waste any time from, from what I saw, because from there, the next thing was fetish, right? It was fetish, yeah. Yeah. Fetish. Uh it was, I was working, so after we came back from the pandemic, I was working with a production company mm-hmm. in Beverly Hills. Um, and the owner of the company, it was like a new production company. Mm-hmm. Are you putting the car back up in the background? Yeah, no, that's a, uh, my my kitchen window is open and oh, somebody outside my I place. Thought it was so. me. That's yeah, no. <laughs> that's how good your speakers are. That's, that's um, a good mic, yeah. <laughs> um. So I was working for a production company at the time. There's, there's, there's a, a very, there's another sob story that that goes into this. Everything that I do that's good starts with something bad. Like it's, mm-hmm. that's just a pattern. Um, but I was, I had a feature film that was a feature film script that was, uh, there was a woman that attempted a very elaborate theft of it, 
uh, mm. embroiled me in something that ended up, you know, having a lawyer involved. It was really awful. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> you know, what? I will get into it a little bit. So okay. I had a, I, the, the Cliff Snow's version of it is I had a feature film that people uh, feature film script, the one that I had previously gotten funded and then not funded before I did Sharon. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I was back on the path of trying to get it funded. And this woman who was another screenwriter and fellow producer, um, she read it and, and I know now what happened. She read it and really wanted her boyfriend to direct it. Right. Mm -hmm. It was a very good script. I'm, I'm happy to say that it's, it's attracted a lot of attention through the years for me and like obviously attracted investor interest. Mm -hmm. Um, so she ended up telling me that she wanted to help me produce it. Right. Didn't tell me she wanted her boyfriend to direct it. Mm. I was like, well, I, I really don't need anyone else to produce it with me. I already have like lines to financing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna act in it. The, the thing about it was it was a small enough movie specifically so that I could act in it. It was going to have like a $500,000 budget and that I knew I could raise. Right. Sure. Um, she told me I can get you two million dollars for it. You'll still be producing it. You'll still be acting in it. And I remember at the time I said to her, like, "Why are you helping me?" Right? And she, yeah. she said, um, "She said I just she went I just see a lot of me and you." Right? She's like, "I just want to help the next, you know. I just want to help you. I see a lot of me and you." And I was like, "Well, that's sweet. I, I, I'll never believe anyone that has an altruistic like." Yeah, no, to, that's to not a thing in this town. I mean, I I respect people a lot more when they tell me what it is they want up front. And then I go, okay, well, if it's all on the table, let's let's figure it out. Yeah. But I hate this backstabby bullshit. Yeah. So she said, well, all you have to do is she's like, I'm working for this other company. I need you to just like option me your script. She's just option it to me and blah, blah. I'm just going to use standard boilerplate language. Don't worry. You're still attached as the producer. I'm like, okay, because the thing is my alternative is I could just make it myself exactly the way I want to make it for the budget that I have. And mm -hmm. I won't, you know. But she was like, "Oh, I can get you more. Then you'll be, then you'll be in a two million dollar movie instead of a five hundred thousand dollar movie." I'm like, "Oh, and, you know, like anybody sure. would be enticed by that." Yeah. Immediately upon me optioning it to her, she's lying to me the whole time, saying mm -hmm. that I'm like, you know, that she's putting the pieces into place and like everybody is like totally on board with me acting in it and blah blah. And she wouldn't let me talk to any of the people that she was claiming she did you know her red flag. Yeah. direct it um that i knew but that i didn't mind at that point right mm -hmm. what i didn't know was that he was rewriting the whole thing into torture porn and like oh, dropping, for fuck's sake. dropping the core message of it um mm -hmm. and and I'll, I'll fast forward all the way to the end it turns out she was also casting my part out from under me right and she she didn't understand how small the Asian community of entertainers is in Hollywood yeah. and actresses were sending me messages left and right. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah. So I knew instantly and I needed to talk to her immediately. But the thing about it is I, I promise I'll cut to the chase and I know we keep it's saying all good. That. No, 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 no. It's, I mean, this is the opportunity to tell the story. So this is, you know, what it's here for. Yeah. I, one of the actresses that can, that, messaged me, sent me the casting notice I'd never met before. And mm -hmm. her name is Sue. So that's the end mm -hmm. of the story. I mean, that's going to come up later in the story. Um, and so she was kind enough, even though she auditioned for the role, to screen grab everything, send, send me everything so that I had everything I needed to go to this woman and be like, what the fuck? What the actual fuck? And it got even worse because she had made me quit my job at Warner Brothers because she, because she said you're gonna have to quit your job because we're starting production on this and you're you're a producer, so she put me in a very she, it was so diabolical. She put me in this vulnerable position where she knew I'd have no other income mm -hmm. and she would have to you know and then I wouldn't I wouldn't have any power to like object to the fact that her boyfriend had wanted to start casting other people you know and somebody famous he wanted Maggie Q basically like mm -hmm. specifically wanted Maggie Q um, mm -hmm. and he wanted to rewrite it. So it was, it was awful. I confronted her about it. She was like, um, I'm, you know, the jig was up. Right. So she went, I'm really sorry. She was like, I really thought that in the end, when we made the movie that you would be 
that it would have been good for so many people that you would have been okay with how hard I was screwing you over. And she literally uses those words. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Holy fuck. So it was, it was awful. It was a terrible experience. And then even then, you know, I had to get the option reversed and she dodged me for like months. You know, yeah. she dodged like the letter that would have reverted and she had already admitted that she was trying to fuck me over. So when we spoke, she was like, oh yeah, freely and gladly. I'll gladly, you know, I'll gladly yeah, no, like, that's never the case. Yeah. Quick claim. Totally. You've, you know, you've caught me. I'll do the quick claim. Dodged me. It was horrible. And the whole time she was dodging me, I was worried that she was off making the movie. Right. Yeah. So all this is to say fetish comes around <laughs> and I have, I'm working for this company, this production company now. And they said, uh, we need something that the, the women that I was working with, really good friends, they mm -hmm. were like, at that time, because we'd kind of been in the trenches together, they were like, um, we need something that'll get us awards. We need something that's going to get us like potential Oscar attention, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was, but I think I'd been fucked over so badly so recently, right? Mm -hmm. I'm starting to feel like nobody's going to let me do what I want to do. And it doesn't matter how many awards I get, how hard I work, you know, how, how, how many pages I write, right? At the end of the day, someone's going to try to screw me out of it. So I just had this, like, I don't even give a fuck anymore, like attitude. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were like, uh, we need a, we need you to write something that'll get us Oscar attention or awards season attention. And I was just like, I'll write you something. I'll get an Oscar. <laughs> and I really believed it. Cause I was yeah. like, why the fuck not? You know, like there's, no, there's no more room for self doubt. You got or nothing to lose. Insecurity. Like yeah. I was just like, let's go for an Oscar. I don't give a shit. Let's do it. Yeah. And then they were like, well, do you want to act in it? Cause they're, they're really cool. They're like my, my fellow producers on this. Like, do you want to act in it? I was like, yeah, I want to act in it. Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's do this. Right. Um, there was such a level of like complete loss of insecurity and self doubt at that point because mm -hmm. it was like gone full nihilist. Nothing matters. Why not me? Why not an Oscar? Who gives yeah. a shit? Let's see what happens. Fuck it. Yeah. And then you got qualified. And then we qualified for an Oscar. <laughs> fucking hell. I mean, you know, see what happens when you just don't fucking care. That's amazing. We did it. We made the thing. Um, you know, it hit the festival circuit. It won. It won. It won. Like it got mm -hmm. it. Um, qualified for an Oscar. I, it, it was, it's wild. And then, and then from there, after that, nobody since has questioned me when I wanted to act in something. No one's questioned me when I wanted to be sole writer on a project. Like, um, yeah, I used to you're hear two for all, two at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I hear all kinds of like, um, oh, there's a helicopter. Sorry. Uh, I used to hear all kinds of like, well, you can do this or that. Oh, you want to be the head writer on, or you want to be the only credited writer? Okay, well then you can't act in it. Oh, you want to direct it? Okay, well then you can't act in it. Oh, you want to produce oh. it? Then you can't direct it. You know, um, and and after fetish, and you know, after qualifying for an Oscar, and that's a whole other thing. Um, we were never going to get an Oscar because running an Oscar campaign is very expensive. <laughs> so, yeah, there is that. I called it like we we did what we set out to do. We're on the ballot. You know, we're. Academy members are screening it in all the official platforms. Like, I, I, you know, the, the Oscar yeah. campaign will come on the next one when I have a bigger budget. So yeah, but it and and all that shit's political. But the fact that you made it to the ballot—that's a big fucking deal. It was. It, it was like the. It was already the finish line for me, yeah. um, and it was life changing because I think what I realized was from fetish was, um, fuck it, fuck yeah. it. Yeah, honestly, like drown everyone out. It doesn't matter. Everyone's going to tell you no. Um, mm -hmm. And I know it's very hard to not care that people are saying no and telling you you're not good enough. Um, but maybe just sustain enough emotional trauma until you don't feel anything anymore. And then when people tell you no, it will sound as as like just a dog barking in the background. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As impactful as a yes. Who cares? Just do it anyway. Yeah. And and now look at me. <laughs> no, I didn't mean for that to sound like that, but no, but uh, it, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure at one point you'll put a therapist kid through college for, for, for dealing with all that, because that's just like what what happens is that this stuff 
does grind people down. You know, it does. And Hollywood is for people who have like, like, like we said, the masochistic streak or just like the sustainability of, uh, you know, being able to deal with constant levels of rejection all the time. Uh, you just just being able to deal with that and let it roll off your back. You know, that's that's not a sense that's developed uh, immediately. That's 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 a callus that builds up over yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. And so I so ego or a callus. And yeah. If you didn't start out with an ego. You develop a callus and then the callus can masquerade as your ego. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, but I think, but you, you kind of nailed it with at one point it's like, well, everybody's saying, no, I think I can do this anyway. So fuck mm -hmm. it. You know, yeah. and that, that right there, I feel like is if there's one thing anybody watching this can take away from that is just to learn to say, fuck it, you know? And, yeah. So and just. Yeah, what's the worst that could happen? You make something that's a piece of shit. You learn better the next time. Yeah, you the, know? Next, the next one will be less of a piece of shit because you got the piece of shit part out of the way. Out of the way. And everything is a lesson. You know, every like, oh my God. I I I always, you know, when I'm when I'm producing theater, I'm always trying to put forward the best show possible. But every once in a while, you just get on a project that's just a fucking dog. And no matter <laughs> what you do. No matter what you do, it's a goddamn disaster from top to bottom. Everything fucking falls apart because there's so much like an acting career. There's so much about producing something that everything just has to fall into place. And there's only so much control that you have, mm -hmm. you know, and then sometimes it's going to, uh, you know, you're just going to hit, hit with curveball after curveball after curveball. And you're just going to strike out. I I always like to think of like the ones that are complete shit shows. I sit there at the postmortem and go, what did we learn? You know, right. and what can we what can we learn from this? You don't always you're not always ready to learn from success, but you you have to learn from failure in order to progress, you know, yeah. and it's it's so at, at the very least, I'm like, OK, well, I appreciate these challenges because now I'll fucking know better for next time, you know. Yes. So, yeah, there's, and value. there's so much value in it. As yeah. long as you let it like damage you to the point where you can't function, you'll you'll gain something very valuable from it. One hundred percent, absolutely. So, um, and I meant to ask this about Sharon too, but where uh, are are Fetish and Sharon streaming anywhere? Is there are they viewable anywhere at the moment? We're, we're still trying to find a home for Fetish. It's okay. hard with short films, um, but that mm -hmm. concluded its run earlier this year. Okay. Sharon, you could watch on like Tubi. I think you can watch it on everything now. So oh, shit. okay. You can watch it on Tubi. You could watch it on, and and everyone that's listening to this, um, definitely set your your visual bar at iPhone eight, <laughs> so, but <laughs> but I can vouch very much for the storytelling because like despite the iPhone eight ness of it, it was the storytelling that got it to can, that got it sold, that got it festival wins. So I'm very happy to vouch for that. Um, and so I think you can watch on Google Play, Apple TV, Tubi. Okay. Um, if you Google it, you'll find it. it. It's out there. It's like, you know, it's the age of VOD. So nothing is on one platform anymore unless it's like a Netflix exclusive. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I, that I've got a feature I did a few years ago that, that I want to say, Oh God, some, some little distribution company picked it up and they stuck it on everything. They stuck it everywhere they could. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. Awesome. Well, I, de I definitely know what I'm going to be screening this week. I'm very excited for that. So thank you. Yeah, no, of course, of course. And let's see. Um, now, fetish itself, just real quick. Now, that's a that's a that's a short comedy about uh, the description. Here. Oh up. yes. Yeah, talking about the movie itself. An Asian woman's one night stand takes an unsexy turn when breakfast the next morning comes after comes with the side of fetishism. Yes. So that's yeah. obviously a deeply personal story. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dating is very difficult uh, for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. If you're a minority, it's got an extra layer of nuance to it. You have to be careful that you're not just being fetishized. Mm -hmm. uh, and and for Asian women in particular, there's like very uh, there's a lot of danger in being fetishized, right? Because the fetish usually comes with the idea that you're submissive. You attract a lot of dangerous mm -hmm. men, right? Yeah. Um, that's not what this short is about. This short is a comedy. <laughs> yeah. But what? But it what is. But comedy is just pain plus time, you know. So yeah. 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 So, um, I'll let I'll let people discover it for themselves when it it goes up, and I, you know the, the description is everywhere. But, um, 
I wrote it around the time. Well, first of all, I was tasked with writing something that was going to be great for award season, mm -hmm. but it was the Atlanta spa shootings. Um, yeah. Really turned what to me was always something I could kind of like, uh, you know, lament, but also kind of dryly laugh at like what a disaster being an Asian woman in the dating world is, you know? Yeah. Um, and then it got really not funny when the national into actual violence yeah or the national conversation is around how a guy blames his sex addiction on asian women in particular and then decides to shoot them you know um yeah. mass um so that's kind of where i felt like i need to i need to we need to address that particular subject um and 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 kind of like bring attention to the fact that fetishism isn't something that's harmless you know a lot of the things that people dismiss about it, it's like oh you're complaining about people wanting to have sex with you you know people who look yeah. like you like oh boohoo can i be fetishized like that is not very helpful to the conversation because no there's a difference between being desirable and being fetishized and the fetishization comes with like a, a dehumanization aspect mm -hmm. that isn't sexy and it's not fun it doesn't lead to love right it, it, it leads to a lot of danger and it leads to like a lot of pain and suffering for a whole group of people just based on how they look so um like i said it's a comedy and <laughs> <laughs> but you know but that's the thing but that's the that's the wonderful and amazing thing about comedy is i mean this is this is a way to expect uh to express hard truths in a palatable fashion well you that's know? what that's what happened was it, it it's very lighthearted and it touches on some of that stuff but it, it's really relatable now mm -hmm. there's there's a dark side to that coin right is yeah. that i think it got as far as it did and got as many accolades as it did on the festival circuit because it you know for for i hate the term woke because it's weaponized now yeah. as anything that's compassionate can be labeled woke and dismissed right mm -hmm. um, yep but for being as controversial as the subject matter was, it was a comedy and it was lighthearted. So I think people were, it provided a safe context in which people could watch it, identify themselves as one of the good ones, right? And walk away feeling like, oh, that is a problem. And thank God I'm the kind of person who would never do that to an Asian woman, right? That, that was yeah. really what people were able to take away from it. Um, while my hope was that they internalized, like, they, you know, that, that there's, that the problem exists. Yeah. Um, but the problem with making a statement piece for better or for worse is that you, the writer, and in this case, also the face of it become like someone who has to be the standard bearer for that particular issue. Mm -hmm. And the festival run was actually very exhausting for me because people would want to come up and talk to me about the issue. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's still something that is very hard to understand if it's not a lived experience and what people would extrapolate from it was often um like only only half right or like, how do i how do i describe it all right the best example i had was like a lot of like caucasian people would come up to me and be like wow that was a great film blah blah and i'm really glad you pointed out fetishism because it's not just Asians that get fetishized, blondes get fetishized too. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yep. Leave it to us to make it about ourselves. Yep. 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 And yep. I would be like, it's a, it's a different thing because mm -hmm. we're talking about fetishism is a power dynamic thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And blondness in our society is not a fetish. It's like a, a, an attribute that people think is attractive. Right. And people want to date blondes mm -hmm. because they think that, being blonde is attractive and it's not the same thing as like being um in a position of oppression and like you know subjugation and i, I don't want to get too into it because yeah. it's happening and i could feel it happening again yeah. don't, <laughs> we, we don't we don't have to but you know I feel like this conversation over and over again where people would come up to me like thinking they were connecting with me and i and i really wanted to honor the fact that they felt like they got something positive out of it but yeah. they would get the wrong thing out of it and then I would have to gently tell them, um, you missed the point, but I'm glad that you got I'm glad it made you think a little bit, at least, you know, even yeah. if it was a little, yeah. yeah. Tough, tough conversations. Um, oh, geez, yeah. Gina, Gina, who was in it with me, 
had a conversation with a friend who watched it and was like, um, and she was saying to her friend, yeah, like, you know, it's Asian fetishism is not like um, often talked about and blah, blah. And her friend went, well, yeah. And also that Asian girl in the movie was fetishizing that white guy. And it's like, no, she, she wasn't. First of all, you can't fetishize a white guy. You can't fetishize the default. Yeah. That's, it's like. The it's default. like fetishizing vanilla, you know? Yeah. It, and so, and then she didn't know how to have that conversation with that person. Mm. She's like, no, this is not a story where the two people are on equal footing. Yeah, it's and, not an equal power dynamic. Yeah. Um, so needless to say, I feel like I've made my statement piece for a good long while. Yeah. And, uh, I bore that standard for a really long time and had to have those conversations with a lot of people across the country because this mm -hmm. thing went to Arkansas, this thing went to Missouri, this thing went, I mean, this thing went. Mm. Yeah. And, and and so all of my future projects, I'm going to really try to do more of the Donald Glover thing, which is um, tell compelling stories that are like genre, mm -hmm. that's like genre films, where the story is... The, the, where the statement is nuanced, which which yeah. every every conflict, every issue deserves a nuanced approach anyway, right? Um, so that's kind of how I've arrived at my current career path. Like maybe somewhere down the line, I'll go full Spike Lee again and like you know do do a really overt statement piece. But yep. I see why it's so hard to do it now. Like I got just a little taste of it, and it's exhausting. Like yeah. Um, yeah, because you, like you said, putting yourself out there is the face of it. You have to, and constantly just, I, I can't even imagine what the, that, that's like, just constantly having to like justify the argument over and over and over again, you know? And then, and, and I can't tell what's more enraging, the idea of somebody arguing with you about it or somebody just not fucking getting it, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like, I, I can't imagine what would make me want to beat my head into the wall more, you know? There, so. were, a few, there were certainly a few of those festivals where I was like, they would say something to me and I'd be like... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you yep. got it. You're definitely one of the good ones. Oh God. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Yeah. But again, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, that being said, this did, this did crush it on the circuit. I'm going to, I'm going to throw this up here. Manhattan short film festival, best actor for best short uh, nominees, winner for best actress, uh, 2020. Whoop, what the hell did I just do? Whoops. I clicked on the wrong thing. Here we go. Vegas movie awards, best indie short award of prestige, best comedy, best duo, uh, outstanding pan vision short, uh, comedic actress, uh, nominee, comedic act nominee writing award. I mean, yeah, you are fucking doing it all. And, it, and, and it's just, and rocking it and just shit. Just so impressive. So impressive to see that. Like that is, that is so dope uh and yeah and then but then you talk about going into genre pieces and then i guess that is the perfect segue to go into to autopilot okay. at that point yeah so, so that that was that's the latest one on the rounds right now yeah so gina the actress that was the one who set me up to get my feature script back mm -hmm. uh, we ended up forming a really uh great really special friendship and yeah. she wanted to do a sci-fi film um, it's kind of like the beginning and it's like, that's basically it. like we, we were, she, we were, she's like, I want to do a sci-fi film. I hope she won't mind me telling this story, but she and, uh, her, she and her friend, Matt, who was also in autopilot, mm -hmm. had written a script together that wasn't a bad script at all. It was, it was, it was really good. And it had a very powerful environmental message behind it. However, when I read it, because she wanted me to produce it, um, I, I could just tell it wasn't going to do the festival thing well, hmm. right? Uh, because short films really need to be, yeah, it's really constricted. Like the time, the time you have to get a, you have to get a story structure um, completely nailed in a very short amount of time. You have to lead people on a journey and like make whatever point you're making succinctly but also like have impact short films are a whole other thing mm -hmm. um just don't have the room to breathe right so i could just tell i'm like it, it, what what they wrote seems like it need it it fit inside a larger world that they wouldn't have any time to build within the constraints of, of a short film so i mm -hmm. told her she needed to do something that was more um high concept 
and she asked me if I had an idea that I could write, which was so generous of her, right? Because essentially what she was saying was this thing that her and Matt had written together, she was letting me throw it away, mm -hmm. which, you know, what, what writers- That's trust. Do, yeah, what writers do you know are willing to let you do that? Like it's, yeah. And I wrote autopilot and she starred in it and we worked on it with my favorite DP, Daphne, mm -hmm. Wu, who's her career is like insane. Um, if we just talked about her career, we'd be here for three hours. She's like, oh, wow. She's she's BAFTA recognized. She's like profiled in American Cinematographer magazine. And for some reason, with all of that, she still wants to work with me. So I don't know. <laughs> but um, I'm very grateful and like very game honored. recognized game, you know, uh, I would. I, as big as and as big and as healthy as my ego is, there mm -hmm. I really have to humble myself. Daphne's a juggernaut, and like I have to be really grateful that she somehow still wants to do things with me. So, um, she was the DP on Autopilot. Like mm -hmm. the look of it is so beautiful, and we really owe it to her. Gina's acting in it is spectacular, and then Gina was the one who um, pushed me to direct it, which was interesting because I I said to her as a producer writer, I said, okay, this is the budget and this is what you've got for a director. And it's not a lot. Right. And I, I was prepping her for like, you're going to have to hire somebody who we, we have to find someone who's got talent. Right. But it's kind of, but they haven't really cut their teeth on a lot of things. So we have to be taking a risk on somebody and we have to really trust that they'll know what to do and blah, blah, because no director who's like got, a number of accomplishments under their belt will do it for this amount and she mm -hmm. was like well why don't you just direct it and i was like me no and she was really encouraging of me doing it because she was like well you've got the vision already and i'm sure when you wrote it you already knew how you wanted it to direct it so just direct it and you know th those are the i'm only fortunate now to have in, at this stage in my life to have a friendship like that mm -hmm. because most of us in the industry don't have friendships like that like yeah ones where like it is fully like supportive like that and like people willing to take a risk on you and people you know who and i knew even if even if i did somehow fuck it up that she wouldn't be mad right mm -hmm. she she was the one who like she was putting her stamp on it like she wants me to be the director and we were both going to just live with whatever we got <laughs> out of that experience of because i hadn't directed a sci-fi before mm -hmm. um and um you know, most of my adult life, I would say, especially with a, pro a producer's personality, um, attracted a lot of friends who are more on the performance side of things. And it's such a brutal profession to have being an actor or a model or a singer. Um, and there's just a lot of like tearing each other down that is built into those professions. Yeah. Uh, it's so competitive, right? It well, because you could be friends with somebody and still be in competition with them for a role. And no matter how good you are, there's always still going to be some degree of hard feelings. It, you breeds, know? it breeds a lot of those kinds of um, dynamics and habits. And I, I would say for a lot of my adult life, I had friends who were, you know, this isn't a dig at them. Like I, I'm being very empathetic about it. The profession they chose creates certain personality quirks right and one of those things is like just by second by second nature just kind of like anytime someone has something good you kind of take them down a notch right and it comes from a place of like insecurity and I, I had you know just a lot of that in my life a lot of people like i couldn't do anything good without like a friend telling me you know that it wasn't that good <laughs> yeah and and in Gina and in Daphne, I have like two friends who would never do that. Like there's a litmus test and that has been, has made all the difference for like this next chapter of my career, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, at a certain point, you have to let people's negativity be, you have to make it so that it affects them and the people that still allow it. And you have to stop allowing it. Right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So a litmus test that, that I have these days is like, you know, I'm very self-deprecating, not on this pod. For some reason in this, I'm like an asshole. <laughs> but generally, <laughs> generally in, in daily life, right? Like it's um, very self-deprecating. If, if I'm proud of something, I'll talk it down and then wait for the other person to be like, no, no, it's really good, right? And that, that 
pitch does not get knocked out of the park that way by the other person. I that's you know what let's abandon that metaphor. I didn't do that correctly. Mm. But like that oh, lobbying, yeah. setting that up doesn't always get you the pay payoff that you're looking for. And yeah, I was self deprecating, and then I had um, you know people around me who would like pile on. I'm like. Ugh. I think I'm getting old. Yeah, I was going to say something about that. You definitely look old. You know, like oh, like God. that. Kind of thing. You need like, some better oh. fucking friends. I mean, it, it, it comes with the territory. It comes with that. Yeah. Where I'd be like, you know, like, for example, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, Sharon, it, you know, it's good, but it was shot on iPhone 8. And then, you know, I had friends who'd be like, yeah, that's really what made it pretty, you know, that, that's, what, that's what really ruined it. Like, they would just, like, jump, like, any opportunity, you open the door, and they just, like, but like battering around through it um, with more negativity, like anything that you let them do. And it's very strange. I'm, again, I'm not trying to dig on anyone. I'm, I'm saying this mainly because I think a lot of people that listen to this can relate to being in the industry, right? Sure. Wait till you find a group of people where you're like, this isn't very good. And they're like, shut the fuck up. It is amazing. And you're amazing. <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah, you find that group of people and then you're like, no, you're amazing. And they're like, no, you're amazing. And and I know it sounds stupid and juvenile and probably not genuine and inauthentic, but who cares if it's inauthentic? Because that vibe or that energy and that dynamic is what you as a group need to like, you know, rise together. Well, and that's the whole thing. It's like, it's like you see, you know, Key and Peel supporting each other and cheering each other on, you know, and you see like, you see the successful folks building each other up you know yeah. and being there and being the wingman and supporting each other with their with their you know they're both they're they're there when they win and they're there when they lose you know yeah. and it's it's always just like the rider dies and they 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 build each other up and they keep each other you know uh they they keep each other grounded mm -hmm. but it, it but also don't ever like lose the plot of the fact that this is really fucking hard you know, yeah. and that this is a struggle every day to 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 claw your way into this industry and uh, to be to get anywhere, really. So, you know, having friends that will help build you up, even if, you know, deep down you both know, OK, this isn't perfect. But having a friend that's like, fuck off, this is amazing and, and highlights all the good things about it. Like, yeah, those are those are the people that you want to work with. And those are the people that you so want to keep around you because it's all just too goddamn hard. It's hard. It's too it's, hard. Yeah. And the, it's, it's what gives me confidence that this next chapter is going to be easier. Right. Because yeah. it's like I'm not one person anymore trying to do things. I'm yeah. like one of like, you know, a core group of uh, really trusted crew members and fellow creatives that have this attitude about each other. Right. Yeah. And um, so it's not just me. It's, I'm like eight people now. Right. So if yeah. I fail, it's cool. I still got seven winners who, you know, will make sure I don't fall very, like very far. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's really like the main thing that you need to survive. I think. Yep. A hundred percent in in this because it's it's tough and that's kind of made all the difference and and autopilot has been a blast i mean we made it people love it it's it's one it's arguably been the most successful thing that i've done so far it hasn't been in deadline yet but it was mentioned in hollywood reporter i think um uh, but it's, yeah. it won like a major sci-fi festival in china it won it won me like a best director award in korea um it won Best Sci-Fi at the Michaud Film Festival. We just won all of Vail. Vail Film Festival is not even a genre fest. It's like a prestigious independent. Yeah. Film. And they gave it to, they gave it to a science fiction short. Un unheard. Which, yeah, that's like a superhero movie winning an Oscar. Like that's just yeah, like very, what, what? Yeah. We were completely flabbergasted and so grateful to. This is this is like a festival for real filmmakers and they're fucking right. hooking you up. That's dope. Right, right. So. Um, and the thing is, for all of, for all the success that Autopilot has had, like, what's been more gratifying about it is that the the journey has been fun because of the people that I'm on it with, um, and even when we don't win a festival, we've still hung out, laughed, networked, you know, mm -hmm. went to some cool parties, 
you know, have some shared experiences that we'll talk about forever. Yeah. Um, and that should be what any creative endeavor is. And unfortunately, yeah. it takes a lot to get there. Um, there's so many pitfalls and so many bad people that I've, you know, <laughs> yeah. that, that I, you I ran a theater company with 80 people in it. And yeah, you know, it doesn't matter how hard you try work to try to filter and just get like the, the folks that you're compatible with. I would say the good folks, but like folks that work with you and you vibe well with and stuff like that. And there's always going to be people who slip through the filters, and you know, and like, yeah, there's a lot of fear that, that, yeah. makes that way. Right. Like you're like, um, if you know somebody is like a bad creative partner or a bad business partner, there's like, yeah, but if I cut them out, I lose these things that they bring to the table. Right. Yeah. Same thing with like friendships, like mm -hmm. industry friendships. You're like, you know, wow, they're really not good for me. But if we're not friends, then we're enemies. And if we're enemies, then they're out there doing damage. Like, you know, yeah. that I'll never see. So everyone keeps each other so close when it's just really not, even when it's not good to have negativity close to you. And and it's all fear driven. And you, you really have to, it's such an impossible task because we're all scared people. People with egos are people that are scared <laughs> that their ego yeah. will be, you know, that they'll be proven wrong and not deserving of their ego. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's an impossible task to be like, you know, fuck it. So I lose all these things that come with this particular friendship. I lose all these things that come with this business relationship. Fuck it. Then then toss toss it all out. Who cares? Yeah. Find, find a better package. There's going to be people out there that are going to have better packages um, to offer you. And uh, not to say that everything is transactional. I, I mean, emotionally, too. Yeah. So, well, just a bit and a better. I don't know what this means. <laughs> no, but I, I'm, 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 I'm picking up what you're putting down. I, it's, it's, it's difficult to articulate, but yeah. And I've definitely had moments of like, I, I produce free nonprofit or like I produce non-paying nonprofit, literally nonprofit, small theater. And the number of folks who, uh, when they broke off their friendships with me and kind of showed their true colors, were like, I thought you were going to get me someplace, man. That's the only reason why I was ever nice to you. I'm like, Wow. Ew. I'm like, well, first off, fuck you. But second off, like, what the fuck did you think I was going to be able to do for you? You know, like we're doing fucking theater in a form of furniture store. Like this is not, <laughs> this is not Hollywood, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, but it's, a, it's amazing though. And it, God, you're talking about, you know, having, you know, keeping your, your, your enemies closer and everything, because that's, that's like sad to say it is legitimate because, you know, then there are a lot of relationships that are just, transactional to so to find genuine connections and to find your team and to find your tribe is so damn important you know so good good on you for having that and clearly like i watched the trailer for autopilot i watched the clips that you had on imdb i'm gonna i'm gonna link them below uh that uh, the quality of work speaks for itself you know i can see why you walked into veil and fucking crushed it you oh. know yeah, no, we it's there. We're just there to have a good time. We're just there to drink hot cocoa in the snow. <laughs> Fuck yeah, and you know, and bring and and you happen to bring home some hardware while you're at it. So you know, that's that's. But also, just that attitude right there is like, yeah, we're you know, the, let the work speak for itself and not worry about it. You know, if we go home with oh, awesome, if we go home with shit, great. If we don't, we still had a great time. Like that, that I feel like is a really healthy way to look at it. There's also like a, um, like a. Uh, uh, a lack of concern. You, you could be real with each other and the people that I'm collaborating with now, like um, there's no fear that you'll be judged for being selfish. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's been, you know, times where I've been like, Oh, you know, this person and can you like get me to talk to that person? And then they'll be like, I was actually hoping to save that connection with myself. I'm like, totally cool. I'm rooting for your success too. Yep. So you're right, that is a better strategy. Don't worry about it. You know, like mm -hmm. those those relationships in show business are really, really rare where you yeah. can get so honest and look out for other people, but look out for yourself as well and like not hate each other for it. It's so rare. It's so difficult. Yeah. Like, it's um it's difficult to find those people and it's difficult to be that person. Um so we've just basically set up an impossible task for everybody. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah, but you made it work. 
you made it work and that's fucking dope uh but let's also talk about real quick uh the uh what, what you did with the because you went to how many different festivals with autopilot oh a fuck ton from the looks of it so many we've lost this sounds like such an asshole thing to say we've really run out of room on our poster and we have to figure out a way to reconfigure it because it's mm -hmm. just coming like laurel city um so i can't even tell you such a nice problem to have but this uh but this is uh this is the one where you did uh where, where you where you had another statement piece that you that you put together yes am i correct in this yes yes we're we're in the we're in the era where people are you know one of my one of my core values is love is love right mm -hmm. um <clears throat> it's it's difficult like it's difficult to say this without people being like oh you're virtue virtue signaling and it's like you really yeah. can't have compassion these days without people applying a bunch of labels to you and accusing mm -hmm. you of having intentions that are not um not pure so, or altruistic nobody can be altruistic nobody can be sincere in their beliefs yeah so but i'm i'm going to try to phrase this in a certain way so i grew up uh most of us have grown up i would say most people can relate to this where who you are is very discouraged right mm -hmm. if you're if you're a minority in this country like you just kind of live all day long with like people wanting you to be more white right everywhere mm -hmm. um sometimes even your parents want you to assimilate right so who you are is never acceptable um and for whatever you're thinking of in your life that is the example of that People in this country who are gay, um, transgender, you know, have it so much worse right now because so just times it by like a thousand. And that's not me trying to act like I'm so great. It's because of the the for some reason, this country has decided that's the target. Mm -hmm. right? They're like in the crosshairs. Yeah. Um, and I know those crosshairs shift, you know, throughout our history. Um, I know like the Muslims were targeted after 9-11. Anybody Brown was targeted after 9-11. Uh, yeah. I don't know that I've ever seen things as vicious as they are now towards yeah. any people than, you know, non heterosexual folk. And it's mind blowing. So I say, fuck it. If people think it's virtue signaling and anyone who's out there, like who stands for like love is love and you know, everyone should be who they are and what they are is enough. Like anyone that says anything against that, whatever mm -hmm. they can lob at you as an insult to try to like discourage you from feeling that way. Um, fuck them. Who cares? Um, so I just kind of decided like these red carpet things, they're silly. Like, being on a red carpet is silly. And especially for like film festivals, you know, it's not like it's the Oscars. Um, they're like just small gatherings of like, like-minded creatives mm -hmm. um, with a little bit of a moment in the sun and that's what the red carpet is. Um, so I just kind of wanted to make a statement. I don't know. I, yeah. like, so I chose like the colors of the rainbow. <laughs> Well, we got it right here for you. So yeah, I mean, well, it's it's the Instagram friendly square version of the image, but you get the idea. But yeah, this took planning. It took planning and it took strategic purchasing. And I know it's silly. I know it's stupid, but it was a way for me to remind myself that this is one of my core values mm -hmm. uh, and to not forget it. It was like a way to make sure that this was something I really needed to be paying attention to in, you know, the social space um, all the time. It's like as as much fortune um as i'm experiencing like don't forget that there are people that are like fighting a fight right now mm -hmm. um and then there was like during this time there was like a woman that like hung a rainbow flag in front of her store and was killed for it yeah you know so people may laugh at things like this but symbols matter yeah i, I know it's silly i know it's silly but i but you know i don't think this is silly i think this is important yeah. No, I think it I think I think you could downplay it all day, but you made you made a statement with this. And it's, you know, this is this is part of showing up and this is part of being an ally. I mean, easy for me to say I'm a cishet white dude. So, you know, I mean, what the fuck do I know? But um it's you know, it, this is this is this is part of it. And the fact that, you know, you 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 plan this out, 
you took the time and went to one, two, three, you went to six different festivals and, and, and got strategically got these pictures. I think these are even in chronological order here too. So uh, at least that's the impression that I got. And then, and then you assembled this and put it out there. It's like, yeah, that's, uh, well, well, it, it's, it's the action and the intention behind it that I think makes it more than just like, oh, clickbait virtue signaling shit. Like this is, this is real, you know? And this is, this is like, just this, this is showing. We Here we go. All right. Hey, we're back now. Sorry we're about back. that. Yeah. Oh. So apparent, apparently somebody didn't like what I was saying. So they spiked the, uh, they spiked my internet. We just, we literally had a whole like split second blackout and then my router reset. So, yeah. I, I also did like just to pick up where we left. I also at these festivals, I'm seeing a lot of really, really great um, LGBTQIA plus um, mm -hmm. content. You know, people like the festivals yeah. are a great place. To, it's it's hard to find funding for projects that make a statement that's controversial mm -hmm. in general. So you're seeing a lot of statements being made in short films which are easier to fund so um seeing sure. like really powerful stories seeing really powerful experiences being relayed and um you know uh that perspective being pushed really effectively and really artfully i mean festivals are film festivals are really great for that you're gonna see stuff you're gonna see stuff that's gonna be what's on the big screen um five years from now right because this is these people with that message um getting their foot in the door and this is where yeah. they're starting so i'm really excited for the future and all the stories that we're going to start seeing that's awesome and if it, people yeah. don't buy it well fuck them <laughs> yeah 100 <laughs> percent. exactly i really have no patience for bigotry these days like i don't even want it i don't even want to like excuse it you know like oh, yeah some people in certain parts of like the country where they don't get exposed we we live in the age of the internet yeah. we get perspectives on every social media platform if you're yeah. choosing to if you're a bigot now you're choosing to be a bigot so yeah no i agree with that i mean the and and, and they'd rather choose to spread their ignorance as opposed to being open to new things you know and and demand that their ignorance be the uh be the message of the day and it's like no no not not how this works like other people exist we're not just going to ascribe to your narrow view of what you, you think the world is you know so yeah 100 percent um so i guess we could start wrapping it up here i mean i've i've kept you for half at this point this has been lovely and i sincerely appreciate all your time but i, I do want to uh, um you know br bring it up with a couple of wrap-up questions um out of all the ones that you've done so far, what what would you say is your favorite? So autopilot has been the most fun that I've okay. had. Uh, completely drama free. Like it's been the first experience I've had where there hasn't been like a lot of like um, uh, butting heads and some of mm -hmm. it in some cases necessary, but there's been none of that on autopilot and it's just been fun. Um, but my favorite would have to be fetish, I think. Okay. O only because, only because fetish was the, was was hard and challenging in in certain ways. But it was the first project I did with that fuck it attitude. And the fact that that effort was awarded with like an Oscar qualification, <laughs> like I yeah. really felt like, wow, this this is the project where I went from Gandalf the Gray to Grand Gandalf the White. Like for some reason, yeah. it was like that was unlocked. The evolution was like the, I really don't care what anyone thinks about whether or not I'm qualified to tell this story or act in it or, you know, yeah. or, or try to run, you know, run it up the flagpole and like push it towards Oscar. No one's ever going to give you the permission. Sometimes you just got to kick the fucking door on yourself and be like, sup. Yeah. 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 So my instinct tells me that fetish is my favorite and that I'm going to look back on it and be like, wow, that was really when I. That was when my career started. I think. I think. We'll, well I see. Think, I think I'm Sharon well. definitely let, uh, like laid some some big groundwork here for you, and like gave like put gave you gave you the uh, the platform. Gave you know you crawled with that so you could run. You know, so I could see the build up here because uh, 
yeah, I just, you know, I, I see you constantly leveling up each, each project is a step forward, you know, and, and like, I only see what I've seen on Facebook. And I recognize the fact that Facebook is a very curated, you know, very, select you know you can't see the mess desk right now it's all carefully cropped and everything but but you know yeah. like there's even just in our conversation here there's there's demonstrable growth even behind the scenes and an evolution of artistry behind the scenes that is very obvious and and and, and even you know even as we joke about being jaded and exhausted and saying fuck it to the industry like a real still like a, a, a um the un, in undiminishing passion for it you know because if we didn't have that then why the fuck are we here because it's too yeah. too much bullshit to not have to want to be here you know it, yes i think even when you don't feel the passion it's there yeah it's simmering seething <laughs> yeah did you have like a did you have like a favorite memory or moment from any of these that really just kind of stands out something that you look back and it's just like yeah that was awesome like uh, the Michaud Film Festival for Fetish was amazing because mm -hmm. not only was it our premiere, but mm -hmm. we won that festival. And it was so special to me because it was a, um, a BIPOC focused film festival and Oscar mm -hmm. Michaud, um, as a historical figure has been somebody mm -hmm. that I feel like everybody should know about and nobody knows about him. And I've, I've always loved, you know, the fact that his story exists in like our cinematic history mm -hmm. um, is so unsung. And so the fact that that was the namesake for that, what that festival, which is run by like the best people ever, Noel and Courtney, um, the fact that we won that and that they handed me a giant check. <laughs> there's so, there's That's something nice. very primal about holding a giant check like it's conditioned and ingrained in us from watching growing up with television where, oh like, yeah publisher's clearinghouse like, yeah yeah like that person's the winner you could tell look at the size of that check um that was a, a very treasured memory and to to share that with like um my co-stars and uh and my action director was was fun and then um or actually he was an action director on that he was a he was an assistant stunt coordinator. Anyway, I'm, I'm just getting the details straight. He was, that guy, his name is Maverick and he's uh, uh, Maverick Lee and he's Gina's husband. And he worked with us on Fetish as an assistant stunt coordinator. And then he ended up being the action director mm -hmm. on autopilot. So, oh, wow. And I okay. said action director very specifically. I know that title doesn't exist in Western media as much as it exists in Eastern media, but I'll let mm -hmm. people do the dipping there on their own. But I think... Veil might be my favorite memory, though. Yeah. Because only because Gina and I went to that one already feeling like winners because we had just won um, in China um, at the Blue Planet Sci Fi Film Festival, which is huge. Um, mm -hmm. uh, has uh, actually, I won't get into it, but it, it has a very illustrious, like, grand jury, grand jury panel. So, anyway. Um, but we went to literally have fun in the snow and take some pictures. And we, our attitude the whole time was, this is a prestigious independent film festival. There's no way we're going to get an award. Like it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't even discussed. Like it's just an impossibility. So yeah. when we won, I don't know that I've ever felt that way ever. Like, I, I don't know. It, it felt like winning the lottery. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. Well, that's dope as hell. Uh, so now the, the the question that everybody in Hollywood is always constantly asking one another: uh, What's next for you? Yeah. What What do we have in the pipeline? Yeah. Um, I'm I currently have two feature films that are being shopped with some real seriousness, mm -hmm. uh, and at, for at risk of. Knocking oh, yeah. every foot in my apartment. Knock on it all. Yep. I don't want to say too much more, but they sure. it has legs and it has some some heavy hitters looking at it. Um, awesome. But on top of that, autopilot is being developed into a feature. Fuck yeah. Um, and with every um, accolade that we get for it, uh, and when I say developed, I mean like we already have offers out to a listers to get attached, mm -hmm. and we have an executive producer who's. Um, position to get us the funding for it. So the for that one, the pieces just have to, one piece will like 
make the other piece fall into place and then mm -hmm. we're going to have a feature. So um, fingers crossed that 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 one takes off and if not the other two maybe. So I won't say too much more, but um, what I will say is like- No worries, no, no respect. I don't want to jinx it. Short films are a really, really great springboard. Mm -hmm. And if people just want to do short films for the rest of their life, um, by all means do it. And you know the festival circuit is really rewarding in its own um, in its own right. But I started in features, and it's been a long journey back to features. Yeah. So, so right now, what I want to do is make sure that all of these short film festival wins end up like you know just kind of like um, feeding and building that, yeah. to the next feature film. So, if not this year, next year for sure. Come okay. hell or high water. So I love that. So yeah, now a little bit more of the uh, uh, the Eric questions. Uh, the um, how how do you define success? Uh, okay, let me see. There is okay, really quickly, really briefly. So I I had like a romantic interest recently, who kind of got it in his head that I wanted to be some like powerful woman in like an executive office and like green lighting, mm -hmm. like blockbusters and stuff. And um, ugh, it, it was stomach turning to hear yeah. what he thought, what he thought I wanted success mm. to, to look like. Because that, I realized by him saying that, that's definitely not what I, what I think success looks like. I really think success is just having fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just, you know what, just getting to the point where you're just having fun, that's success. Because <laughs> yeah. it's very hard to get to that point. That's, yep. that's my definition of success. And, and if you're, if you're getting, if you're at that point, then either things are going really well or really badly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know what? Yep. Life, life puts you there. So. Fuck yeah. I love that. I love that. And uh, any, any advice, well, if you, if you could go back and talk to your younger self, the pre-filmmaker, the, you know, the starry eyed youth that was, you know, still thinking about uh, sociology, anthropology and thinking about like uh, becoming East Asian studies and everything. And like, what would you go back and, and, and tell them if you could? Um, okay. I have no advice for that person <laughs> because okay. whoever my younger self was oh. and all the things that she did and all the mistakes she made, if all of that was going to result in where I am today, then she did everything right. You know, like I I'm not bragging. It's not like I've not like I've won an Oscar or that I'm rich or anything like that, but um, this is an okay place to be. And there are a lot of worse places to be. And so she, she got me here. So yeah. oh girl, <laughs> Young Jennifer Zhang was, you know, Stick she's with all it. right. Yep. Yeah. You're on the right path, kiddo. I love that. I love that. And uh, best way for people to follow you, keep up with your work, or connect with you online? Uh, do you, what do you, like, what platforms are you on, website, anything like that? I'm a typical millennial. I'm most active on Instagram. Okay. So, uh, at the Jennifer Zhang. And, at the Jennifer Zhang, okay. And my website is jenniferzhangofficial.com. So if anyone Jennifer. wants to find the serious version of me that's where i am love it love it love it and of course i can't oh here we are captions here and should have added these earlier there you go put it in the uh put it in text so people can where to go damn it i'm gonna get better about running this for interviews but yeah take a look follow there it'll also be linked down in the video description and all this stuff Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today. This has been so much fun. I've really, really enjoyed being able to chat with you and just talk about all of your incredible success. Uh, I sincerely wish you nothing but continued skyrocketing success in the future. And, uh, you know, if you ever need somebody to like fill in in a background role or something, give me a holler. So, of course, I'm sure I want to get to the point where I could hire a bunch of people to be in background roles instead of like these films I've got right now where they're generally like limited locations and limited actors. So uh, I will call you when the success comes, the traditional conventional definition of success or whatever. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again. Been a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, well, let's uh, please let me know what else you got, got coming up. Whatever I can do to support, I absolutely wanted to. Okay. Thank you.
You're the thank best. You. Oh, thank you. All righty. So that's another something awesome. Uh, you know, Jennifer, I've been Greg. Uh, checks out something awesome dot blog, uh, gregorycrafts.com. Uh, yeah, I'm hopefully will not let two months transpire between the, this one and the next one. Uh, but I do have a couple of folks with some big stuff happening too. So we'll be talking to even more folks and celebrating something awesome in each of these individuals' lives going forward. So until then, take care of yourselves. Be good to each other.